Um, really quickly, a uh, disclaimer here. Uh, two weeks ago, I was like super sick, couldn't really talk, so my, my team was glad because I finally shut up. Um, but anyway, uh, my throat is still a little bit sore, so if I die here on the scene, just call the ambulance. Uh, but anyways, I, I apologize. I don't know how it's going to end, if it's going to end well. But we, I guess we will see. Like, if, if you hear me coughing, just stay with me. Maybe I will survive. And you definitely take this laptop away from me because it's going to be destroyed. Um, all right. No, I'm serious. Let's move it away. Uh, all right. So I guess, I guess pretty much everyone here, um, or this audience, I could call themselves software engineers. It's a funny thing. Uh, <laughs> it's a funny thing. Uh, about uh, where this term, software engineering, was actually first coined. It was in two, um, 1968 on a conference which was uh, called Software Engineering. Um, cool thing about this conference is that the whole transcript of it uh, is available online, so you can read what else those guys were saying. It was a conference held by NATO, and what they did, they, um, they suggested about like 50 experts uh, and I'm talking about like founding fathers of our industries. I'm talking Edgar Dijkstra or Alan Perl. And they, they met there to talk about the industry and the problems that they see at that time. The name software engineering was choose to be a little bit provocative. They realized at that time that the industry need to be based a little bit more on theoretical foundations and more uh, principal discipline. Now what you might be thinking, come on. It's 1968, 50 years ago, right? 50 years ago. Obviously, our industry moved on, right? Well, let me give you a little bit of, little of quotes from that paper. A system is best designed if testing is interlaced with the design instead of doing the test at the very end. This is test-driven development, right? Or they realize that on, you can only really rely you know, good software if you do it in small groups. How many of you guys actually been on a death march, right? Where your pretty hairy boys would say like, okay, why the hell are we not moving twice as fast? I just doubled the type of, this, of the team. We've, we've all been there, right? And they already realized that. They realized that there actually is a structure of communication within the organization. And that for the small groups that that communication structure is intuitive. So they, the small groups can actually live and can understand the organization, the communication that happens in it, while for larger groups, it's a pain that they have to face. It's a problem. So it's all we basically have been learning with DDD, like the main driven design, right? And you might be thinking, well, come on, there are still things that they were discovered recently in the recent decade. So how about Agile? They realized that there's a, they, they made a process how to make correct software. Take the whiteboard and draw your solution. Then write a piece of code until you understand it. You don't understand it. Then go back to the whiteboard and they, they review the whole process one more time. It's agile. Well, if you're not convinced it's agile, well, okay, so let's try to figure out what agile really means. Yeah, I know, I know it's, you know retrospectives and iterations and products which are built after each iteration, right, and deployed, and, and we get feedback from the customer, all that. It's pretty new, right? It's the last two decades, maybe? Well, here's another quote. A design was implemented in a number of stages. Each stage needed an act, act, like intellectual activity, and then they did some coding. After each stage, they had a product which they deployed, delivered to the client, and based on the feedback that they had, they pushed some new decision of the design. And basically, the, the product was slowly approaching the final solution in small incremental steps. 1968. And now you can throw away all your agile certificates and be sort of more humble. Now, this is an issue because now we feel a little bit scared, like, what the hell is wrong with us, right? So, the next thing you will find on this slide is this, and you might be definitely, ha, 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 waterfall, right? Ah, they obviously didn't know everything about software development. Well, the moment that one of the speakers presented this slide, it spawned a discussion, and you can see it in the paper, it immediately spawns a discussion between the experts, and they're saying that that, that sort of process of designing software needs the feedback loop. You need uh, information from, uh, from the production, and you need uh, information from the users. So immediately knew that, and that picture was thrown away immediately. Now, 
waterfall is itself an irony in our industry. Because everybody was sort of accustomed to the water for socks, and it's not really that cool, and we should be agile, right? But have you ever seen this paper in your life? It's really funny because in that paper, immediately after this image, like not even, there's no, nothing in between, immediately after this image, you will learn from the author that this design sucks, that he truly believed that it will work, but it never did. It's, it sort of fails, and it's miserable, and you'll always have pain. It's within that paper. To be honest, he actually, within that paper, he introduced iterations, and he in emphasized on prototyping. And the really sad thing about it is, he wrote that paper in 1970-something, 70-something. But those ideas were already present in our industry, and they were provided in two different papers by Bennington and Hossier. Hossier wrote his paper in 1961, but Bennington wrote it in 1956. That's more than 60 years ago. That's, that's when this computer was considered a commercial success for its amazing user experience. Okay? And all, they already knew what we now are rediscovering one more time. So this sucks. And there are some quotes from this paper. I will just skip it because we don't have much time. All right, so we all know there are two problems of computers, of uh, computer science, cache invalidation, naming things, and of one by error. But I will focus on naming things. And I think that's all we do as an industry. So let's talk about microservices. Can anyone tell me what a microservice is? That's a hardly rash question because like, you will get five it's an old joke that you get five experts about microservices experts, and they will give you six different explanations. So let's try to reason about what's the difference between microservice and SOA. So if you go to Martin's folder block, you will learn that eventually SOA isn't really concrete. It, it doesn't crisply define, it's just sort of vague definition. That's why they needed a microservice definition, because it's very, very concrete. We really know what we have in our hand. It's very well defined. Well, you will learn when Alexander Pasik, when he was coining terms SOA, he needed that. Because at that time, client-server definition lost its meaning. It was not well defined. He needed something he could grasp, something concrete. Do you see the irony in it? Um, you will live, even learn that basically a, a Gartner Group didn't even invent SOA. The pattern was known at least for 15 years of how to write distributed systems. They just named the pattern, which was already there, which we did recently one more time. So, uh, are the problems being solved? What does it mean to be a software engineer? I would say we are more sort of software craftsmen, but not in a good way. I mean, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> right? I mean, John the guys would be like, yeah, I'm a craftsman. But um, no, no, don't get me wrong, I want to look like that, right? But what I'm saying is, if you were a blacksmith somewhere back in the day, the only way you would learn about your craft was from your father or somebody in the village who was doing the same thing, being a blacksmith or whatever. You, will, you would learn something new maybe if you moved from a village to village. And it works exactly the same in our industry, unfortunately. Why? Because think about it for a minute. Entry point for our industry is pretty, pretty easy. What, you have to buy a computer, you have to buy a book about programming, and if you're smart enough, in six months you can actually be a junior developer working in a software company. Which, whether it's a, it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's probably a topic for a different discussion here. But what I'm saying is possible. And what you will learn about the industry, how to create software, you will learn it only from your senior developer, who was a junior developer like you three years ago. <laughs> and that knowledge is only in your little village. And you only learn more if you move to another village, right? If you go to a different company. And that's not engineering. So, those guys at NATO in 1968, they already knew that. They knew like, we need to be a little bit closer to practical disciplines, to theory. So, I will make some claims here. I, I will make a claim that going towards engineering requires a better time system, 
Functional programming is our Lord, our Savior, but not any functional programming, this functional programming. And actually, math is deeply rooted in computer science. And I will try to, <laughs> in, in 20 minutes, um, sort of deal, deal with all those points. I hopefully, it's a Scala conference, I don't have to sort of explain why static languages are better. But let's talk about a little bit about type systems. So in C++ and in some other languages, this was kind of a problem, right? Because this code will compile, but it would never do what you would expect it to do. Because that assignment would actually would give you one and the if statement would be true. Java solved it because they only allowed double equal sign in if, right? But the pain is still there. You can have a little piece of Scala code here, which compiles, but it, it essentially means this. Semantically, it's the same than this, right? So we have something that compiles, but <coughs> doesn't necessarily does what we'd like it to do. If you have a, a little bit better type system, like for example, one that understands generics, you could do something like a trait here, or your type class, whatever you name it, and now, which I, like equal trait, like understand that you can only compare things of the same type, and now you can use it, and this will not compile, and that's actually a good thing because now your compiler will scream, you're doing something wrong. Uh, yeah, we have a few minutes for this example as well. You know this guy. So he gives you a quest right now. Can you implement a function that will concatenate two maps? Can you guys? Can you do it? Well, the clock is ticking. <laughs> well, open your laptops, god damn it. Like, <laughs> all right, so that would probably, after like maybe more than a minute, we would probably be able to solve it. Like, how to concatenate two maps together, if, what if the keys collide, what if they don't collide, and things like that. But what if he makes this example a little more exp um, complex, and now it's a map of option, of, of tuple of end of option of financial report, where financial report is collection of invoices. Well, the clock is still ticking. But when you have, when you have something like semigroup, right, which is in its concept, it's trivial, adding two things together, you can immediately <coughs> recognize, sorry, you can immediately recognize that writing a semigroup instance for a pair, as long as A and B in that pair are semigroups, have instance for semigroup as well, is fairly easy. You can, you can do the same thing for option, as long as that element in option is a semigroup, you can write an instance for option of A. And the same goes for maps, as long the, as the values within those maps have instance of semigroup. And then solution to this problem, before the trap explodes, is just this. It's so cool. We would like to get into like, and if you, the more your type system becomes more complex, can do a lot more weird stuff, the more you can rely on your, on your code. And actually, if it compiles, it works. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could prove, actually prove the correctness of all our programs wouldn't that be awesome? Like you, you, just, you just write a piece of software and you know it works? Or how about we could actually have code generated from our types? We just say what we want and it gives us a definition. Or we can prove that our program will actually terminate at some point and give us a value. There is a, something which is called carry Howard correspondence. So Haskell Carey and William Howard, they discovered that there is a isomorphism, or correspondence between logic and programming, that they in fact are the same thing. So they argued <coughs> that a proposition in logic is actually a type in computer science. And proof for that proposition is equivalent to writing a value for that type. And they, they discovered that they are equivalent. So, you guys probably are familiar with logic, right? This is the most classical propositional logic where we have proposition and, or we either have, we can imply something, or we have uh, negation, right? The uh, predicate logic gives us uh, two more things for all and exists. But Carrie Howard, they talk a about a little bit more constrained logic. They talk about logic which is called constructive logic or intuitionistic logic. So that logic only deals with proofs that you can prove something only if you, have, if you can show existence of that thing. So you cannot anymore say, 
Samai exists, and now you know, we have a proof of it. Until you, you show me an example of it, until that you cannot really consider this a proof. So here you have a, a math uh, class in some university on, on constructive logic. So dear student, there exists some number x such that, oh yes, somewhere out there it exists, and we must find it and destroy it. Grab your sword, students, we write. I think I'm in the wrong math class. I'm finally in the right one. Um, so, but the funny thing about this logic is that very referential, um, re um, referential rules in, in classical logic, like law of uh, exclude the middle or uh, double negation elimination, those are not provable in constructive logic. And why that is, I can actually show you in a second. But before we do that, let's talk about that. So, if, if propositions are types and proofs are our programs, let's try to prove this statement. So now we have a proposition, so there must be a type that corresponds to that proposition. Let's look at each of elements at, at one, um, in, in small steps and then we'll combine the final type. So, <coughs> sorry. And is actually, and the x and y is actually a tuple x, y. Or, is a sum type. You can think of it, like, for example, in Scala, that would be either. Um, implic uh, implication, x implies y, would be a function from x, from x to y. So now, uh, creating a type for, uh, for this proposition would look, would look like that. So we have a tuple p uh, and either q or r, and we have to provide a function that will go from this to either PQ or PR. And we can do it with Scala developers. It's not really, it's not really a complicated function. It's, it's, it's fairly easy. And just by that, we just prove a proposition, which is awesome. Why that is awesome? Or maybe before I tell you why, uh, this is actually the proof why we cannot really prove in, in, in constructive logic, why we can really prove statements statement like that, which are provable in classical logic. So if we have to think about why is that, that is not possible, let's try to think what not p means. Not p means if, if not p is true, then p must imply false. But what is false in constructive logic? If true is only where I can construct something of the given type, then the false is only possible if I have a type from which I cannot construct an element. In Scala, that will be nothing. So now, in order to prove this statement, p or not p, we would have to provide an, an instance of this method, either p or function from p to nothing. And if you are able to do it, contact me after this presentation. I will be like amazed. Um, Okay, so what's the point of all this? As I said, computer science is rooted in math, right? I always wondered what that really, sorry, I always wondered what that really, really, really means. Because like, ah, oh, somebody would tell me like functional programming is rooted in math because we, we have algebras and like semigroup and monoid. Those are just convenient names. Monoid could be ten named anything, right? Wouldn't change how it works. So there has to be a little bit more to it. We only, like, given, like, we know that there is a correspondence between logic and programming, fine. But what does it really mean for me as a computer science, like a computer uh, software engineer? It doesn't really mean anything. Fine, there is a correspondence. So what? Logic was known in, in ancient Greek, but it really thrived in the beginning of last century. Logic was, for mathematicians at that time, something what microservices are for now, right now. So it was like everybody was excited. And the reason for that was that they were looking for a way to derive the whole truth out of some basic axioms. I have some axioms, some, ref uh, some inference rules, and from those I can, I can prove either something is false or true. They actually were succeeding a little bit. So there was a, a Polish a Jewish mathematician, Moises Preserberg, who in 1929 proved that for a very limited system, which was a uh, numbers with only with addition, he could, he could create an algorithm that was decidable, which means for any term in that system, he could, 
he had a like, program that could prove whether it's true or false. <coughs> uh, Russell and Whitehead, they, they were leading a group of mathematicians who were trying to do something crazy. They were trying to define the basics of mathematics just on, on the, so they, their basics, the axioms were some simple roof, rules from set theory, and from that, they tried to define the whole mathematics just by simply following the rules, uh, inference rules, and those axioms. So um, this is a quote of the Mathematical Principia Mathematica. And just so you know, 400 pages of that was published just to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. And they were publishing Tom after Tom, and took them like 10 or 12 years, but all the fun was spoiled by this guy. Kurt Goodall, <coughs> in his on formally undecidable propositions of Principia Mathematica and related systems, included something we can now call incompleteness theorem. Now, in order to explain what that is, I would probably need another like this many minutes, but I really, really recommend this book. I started reading it, and it's just, well, it's just amazing in so many different levels and so many different terms. Just so you know that you will, if you go to your library on, or bookstore, you will find it under philosophy, computer science, biology, music, all different places because it covers so many things but show how those, all those things are related together. But they also explain that theorem. But we will only focus on now how, what that theorem, how, that, how he reached his conclusions, but only on conclusions. So Goodall proved that any system that is complex enough to represent arithmetic, simple, so like addition, multiplication, subtraction, and stuff like that, is either incomplete, so it means you cannot prove its own axioms, or it's inconsistent, which means it can derive uh, contradictions. So you can either prove something which is false, which is horrible, because now every statement that you have which you think is true, you're not really sure if it is, because maybe you actually prove something that is wrong. Or you have a system which is incomplete, so you will have some um, elements in it, propositions which are true, but you have no way of proving them. Now, why am I talking about this? Remember, there is a, so that's a pain in logic, and that was a huge pain in, 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 in the beginning of the last century. It basically spoiled all the fun for all those people, and they had to do something else, and their life was sad from that moment. So, so Goodall spoiled all the fun, and it was a pain, but remember, we have a correspondence between logic and programming. So that pain, has to be somewhere in our computer systems that we write. That, ha that pain is there because we are rooted in math. We have this correspondence between the logic. So let's try to look at one at a time. So what does it mean that the sy that, uh, system is inconsistent? Well, it, it means that we can prove something which is false. You probably know, like, whenever you saw any um, presentation about functional programming, you've probably seen this identity and there's only like wire implementation, fine. But could we, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> could we implement, implement um, this function? Is it doable in Scala? Is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, it actually is. You can say no. You can throw an exception. You can call it recursively. All of it will compile. But now if a type is a proposition and implementation is proof, then now we have a, a method that will prove anything. And obviously in some complex system there will be states, statements which are true and some statements which are false. And now we have a prover that will tr prove everything, regardlessly. So whenever you're using one of those, you're basically screwed. You cannot no longer have a pr you cannot longer have ability to say it compiles, then therefore it works. If you're using one of those, why? Because Google. 
Okay, so if it's not consist inconsistent, then it can be incomplete. So we have languages like Agda or Coq, which are assistant provers. In those languages, you can actually write software that if it compiles, it works. You can prove that your implementation will work. You don't even have to run it. You will just write the definition, type definition, you will make it compile, and you will know it works. Okay, but what incompleteness means is that within those languages, you will have no ability to write compiler for those languages in those languages because you cannot prove your own axioms. So even if you are using Agda, most likely the compiler will be written in something else. And that's a pain, right? Because even though you can prove your language, you, this program is as reliable as the compiler or the interpreter for your language. This is a really, really painful thing. So like, like it would be really, really cool if we could have like an automated fear improver, something that we would give him a type, and it would give us a definition. But it, because of Kurt Gödel, we know it's impossible. However, still, those automated fear improvers exist because they can <coughs> sorry, they can reach. They can reach, they can realize they go infinitely and they're not, not reaching a conclusion. So as it turns out, they are very, very powerful and they can still are very usable. And luckily for this presentation, a few months ago, uh, a new library uh, popped out on GitHub, which is called Carry Howard. So the only thing you have to do is add uh, this dependency to your project and you have a function here, some functions, some definition, take some other functions and parameters. The way you could implement it would be just importing this little thing and say implement. And it works, it compiles. Now you can have some functions, like here have a pretty printer that takes long and returns a string. The other one takes an integer and returns a long by adding one. And you can write, you can write a function add and print and, and you can run it and, and it gives you the, here, the result back. It works. You want to write, uh, you want to write new Scala Z or cats or whatever. That's a state monad. State monad takes a function from S to S A. It needs two other functions, map and flat map. Uh, in my previous presentations, if you ever seen them, I always argue that you can follow types to implement that. That's fairly easy. You no longer have to. You just say implement, and it compiles and it works. Before we finish. A real carry hard correspondence is pretty cool because you have to remember that uh, Dr. Nutt is paying one dollar for every uh, error in his book, in his books. So if you can prove that logic is inconsistent altogether or is like invalid, then you would earn this much money, which would be awesome. And one more thing, I think I have time for it. Yeah, I have two minutes. Awesome. So uh, back in 2015, I was at this conference Code Mash in London, and there was a, a, a last panel where they only had language implementators. So there was a guy who implemented Elm, there were Haskell um, uh, creators, uh, there were Erlang creators, and all those other guys, and they were discussing. And the discussion was spawned about types and how you can prove your, your correctness and how you, 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 from types how you can derive uh, correctness of your software. And they were all very excited. And Joe was sitting there silently, not saying his thing. And, and while they were discussing and the atmosphere was very intense, at some point, he picked up his microphone and said one sentence. Your types will not save you if tornado hits your data center. And he dropped the mic. So we have to remember that as well. I want to thank uh, Inspiration, the guy who let me know there's actually a book uh, which Hofstadter wrote, and I want to thank um, this guy. You probably all know all those people. I won't, yeah. So uh, Philip Walder, Paul Phillips, and Daniel Spivak. And Daniel, like, spent like I've asked him a few questions about Kari Howard and about uh, uh, Girdle, and and that spawned like three hours discussion on Slack, which was amazing and, and really inspiring. And uh, yeah, my name is Pavel Schulz. I, I have a Twitter, so if you guys want to complain, there you go. Uh, my company, where I work right now, not my company, company where I work right now is hiring. So if you guys want to do some crazy stuff in, in Scala, I encourage you to apply. And I guess that will be it. Thank you very much. <laughs>